thank you for the uh, thank you for the program. Thank you to McKinsey for sponsoring this uh, lunch here today. My name is uh, Morten Sorensen, and I'll talk about the risk of private equity. So um, this is a, it's a very simple question. So all I want to talk about here is just if you are investing in one of these private equity transactions here, how much risk does that investment carry? So it's, it's a simple question. And in some sense, I think Sharon did a great job of laying out the fundamentals of the private equity industry. So I don't have to go through how these transactions work. I wish I could say we planned it in advance, but it just worked out this way, I think. So um, I want to ask the question of what is the riskiness of private equity transactions? So if you're an investor, what risk do you run? It's, um, it's a simple question, but it's also a question that we don't really know very much about. So in some sense, it fits nicely into a 15-minute presentation because uh, in 15 minutes, I should be able to tell you everything we know. So I think of this talk here as more of a, a sort of a declaration of ignorance than, than, than really talking about um, anything that will really shock you, I guess. So there's a bunch of, there's a literature about the risk of private equity, but it's very small literature. So there are two existing papers that have been published and I wrote one of them. There's another paper that is not written yet, but I'm writing it right now. And I guess sort of having your name on one and a half paper at this point is enough to make you a leading expert um, in this topic here. So I want to tell you how this works and why we don't understand um, how this works. So there, there are two fundamental problems when we want to measure the risk of private equity transactions. So there is a statistical problem and there is a conceptual problem. And I think that the conceptual problem is in some sense the bigger problem, but it's also the problem we know even less about. So today I'll just talk about the statistical problems that arise and show you s some work that I've done there to try to circumvent them. Um, okay, so let me get into this. Why is it important to understand the risk of private equity investments? Well, it's important from an academic perspective because it's sort of a curious part of the financial markets and we want to understand it. From a practical perspective, it's tremendously important also. So if you are a limited partner in a venture capital fund or a private equity fund, you want to know what kind of risk you are running so that you can balance your portfolio accordingly. Um, it's also important from a regulatory perspective. So I'm working with a uh, working with an advisory group that is advising the, um, the European Venture Capital Association in terms of laying out the, 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 the structure of how to measure riskiness of these transactions here because there is new regulation coming up in Europe. There's something called the Solvency II rules that is being negotiated right now that will define the capital requirements for insurance companies that are investing in private equity and venture capital. And these capital requirements are based on how risky this is, so we can determine how much capital these investors have to set aside to cover the risk that we are running. So it's important to understand the risk of private equity, both if you're investing and if you're a regulator and so on and so forth, but yet we don't really know how this works. So let me tell you why we don't understand how this works. So I want to take you back to just sort of finance 101. How do we usually think about risk in capital markets? So I'm sure you've seen these pictures here before. The way we think about riskiness of an investment is in terms of sort of a cap M framework here. So we know that the risk we should care about is the correlation between the market and the investment we are investing in. We know that the idiosyncratic risk is not priced, the systematic risk is priced. And the way we usually measure this risk here is we take some stock and then each day we plot the return on this stock here against the return on the market and we get a plot like the one down here below. So each of these here is a new day and then we run a regression through this plot here and the slope of this line here tells us what is the risk of this investment here and the intercept tells us what is the alpha. So this is how we usually think about riskiness. So if we want to take this approach here and apply it to a privately held company, we have a problem. Because if you have a privately held company, it may be that the value moves up and down every day, but we don't see what the value is because it's private. So we only know what is the value of a privately held company when it's traded. So that's when we buy it or when we sell it. So I have these two dots up there. So we may see there is a buy at the early date and there is a sell at the later date. And we can see what was the return on that transaction and we can see what was the return on the market. But that only gives us one dot down in the graph down here. So we want to draw this line here, but we only have one point. So it just doesn't work. So before we got another point for each day, but here we only get a point for each transaction. So that's the first problem we have to solve. Now, this problem is not so hard because we can just sort of repeat the logic across companies. So maybe we have a lot of transactions out there. We can look at each of them and see what was the buy and what was the sell, what was the return on the transaction and what was the return on the market. So we can get more dots here. Now we no longer estimate this for each company here, but we can sort of estimate it for an industry or for a type of company. So we can solve this problem here and then we can uh, get this line here and the line would tell us what is the beta and the intercept would tell us what is the alpha. 
Now the second problem that arises is that the transactions that we see in the market and the data that we have are not a representative sample of all the transactions that are out there. So the problem that arises is that we only see this, the buy and the sell when there actually is a buy and the sell. And in many cases, you have companies that sort of you buy them and then they just sort of fade away and die and you never see them again. So there is no sell at the other end. So we can only use the companies where we have a buy and a sell, but the companies where we have a buy and a sell are likely to be the companies that have been performing very well. So the way to plot that in this graph here is that all the companies would be all the dots that we have here, but the ones that we see are the darker ones up here. So if we only use the ones that we see, we would overestimate the alpha and we would underestimate the beta. So we have this data problem here, and this is the harder data problem to solve. So I want you to think about how to do that. Okay, so how can we solve this uh, data problem here? Well, so what we're doing in our research here is basically we are combining uh, three tricks. So there are three tricks to that, so I'll go through them and explain to you how they work. The first is that we're using a Kalman filter. So the Kalman filter is a way for us to see, even if we only have a buy and a sell, what was the path of the price or the value of the company in between that. So we can sort of trace out the entire price path even when we don't see it. The second trick is that we want to estimate the probability of observing one of these companies. So it's the probability that it's bought or it's sold or it's refinanced. So, and then we will take these two tricks and then we'll put it into the third trick, which is this hairy statistics trick that I'm not going to talk about here. So uh, I'll just tell you it's very complicated and I have a friend at the, in California who is running big computers so he can do this, um, but that's all I'm gonna say about this. But I can tell you how the tricks work. So the way that, so, so the Kalman filter is the first trick. So the Kalman filter is the statistical model. It was um, developed in the 1960s as part of the Apollo space program. And the way this statistical model works is that you take an object and you only observe it infrequently and you want to understand what is the trajectory of this object here given the different forces that are acting on the object. So if you're looking at a space rocket, you would see, okay, we only see it occasionally when it's sort of flying around. Sort of gravity is one of the forces that is interacting and there are rockets blasting off, so it's sort of moving through space. So this was how this statistical method was developed. And our application of this is to sort of, sort of the math is the same, but we are thinking about it in the terms of private companies. So we have these private companies moving around, and we only see them when there is a buy or sell. And we have these forces that are interacting on them, which are here, in this case, the market forces, and we are using this statistical method here to get a sense of what is the trajectory of the valuations of these companies. So even when we don't see them, we can try to assess how were the valuations moving. The second trick is to figure out what is the probability of a refinancing. So now we have a sense of what is the value at each point in time. So then we can think about the probability of refinancing as a function of the value. And we think that the, more, the higher the return, the more likely it is to be refinanced. So it's the ones that are doing well, we are likely to see. The flip side of that means that if you have a company and you are not seeing it, then that means it's probably not doing very well. So if you have these companies where you buy them today and then you don't see them for another 5, 10, 20 years, that's probably not a very good sign. So we can think of this as sort of introducing a new force on these companies here. So if you buy them and then you don't see them for a long time, that's sort of a downward force on the return. And if we incorporate that in the statistical model, then we can correct for this problem that we only see the ones that are doing well. Okay, so these are the two tricks, and the third trick is that we have this hairy statistic. So I'm not going into that, I'll just I'll put some keywords up here, so if there are any stats buffs in the audience, the keywords are Bayesian estimation and Gibbs sampling, and Markov chain Monte Carlo, and I'm just, I just put them up here because it's meant to look complicated because that's it, because it is. Okay, this, the, simpler, the simpler way to think about this is in terms of this picture here. So what we have here is that we have the, the dotted line in the middle. So the dotted line in the middle, that's the market. Then we have a privately held company here. So we see it back here in 1996, and we see it back here in the second quarter of 1997. So you can see the circle up there. And then we're trying to guess what is the trajectory of the valuation of this company here. So this, the, the, the solid line up top is the trajectory of the company if we didn't incorporate this selection adjustment. So we would think that it's been going up, it probably keeps going up, it sort of fluctuates with the market. So we think of that as a force that's interacting on this company here. We see the blue line down below where we're incorporating the adjustment for the selection. So here you see that it keeps going up in the beginning here, but then the statistics get worried that we don't see the company anymore. So there's sort of years pass and the company is not observed. And then we see this sort of downward adjustment and the statistics sort of take into account that this company is probably not doing well and we should be uh, shading their valuations down. And then the company probably died somewhere around here. 
So this is the way we are using the statistical model to adjust for the fact that the data that we have only see the companies that are doing well. So I just put some estimates up here. This is the results that we get from all of this. It's not very exciting. I have this RMRF row that you may see on the top here. That's an estimate of the beta. The numbers you can see here are around 2.8. So the, the data that we used for this analysis here was venture capital investment, so sort of the US venture capital market. And one of the things we learned from this is that with a beta of 2.8, these investments appear to be more risky than what has been found in the literature so far. So if you remember back, if you don't adjust for this selection here, then you will find a lower, too low a measure of the risk. Here, after we adjust for that, the measures increase considerably. So venture capital is more risky than we thought. What we can see down here is the sort of the adjustment for the probability of being refinanced. We put in the time here since the previous uh, refinancing, and that just captures the fact that as more time passes after you've seen the company previously, then it becomes less and less likely that it's doing well, and we have to start shading the valuation downwards. So all this is baked into the um, statistical model. Okay, so this was the statistical problems that we have solved. And again, this is sort of at the forefront of what our thinking is. So finally, let me just say that, that even though we can solve these problems here and we can run this through a big computer, in some sense, I am, I'm not convinced that we are actually answering the question correctly. And sort of taking a step back, if we are looking at it the way I was just looking at it right now, we're sort of assuming that the CAPM model is the right way of measuring risk. And the CAPM model works for publicly traded securities where you can rebalance your portfolio and you can trade them and so on and so forth. But private equity is different. With private equity, once you invest, you lock up your capital for a 10-year period you're carrying idiosyncratic risk and that should be priced. You cannot rebalance in the way that we are assuming. So in some sense, the way we are forming portfolios of these very illiquid positions here goes beyond what is captured by the standard models. So, sort of that, so as, a, as a final note here, let me just say that I don't think we understand that today. I'm working on a project to try to understand that better with some of my colleagues here at um, Columbia. This is uh, 2012, so you'll have to come back next year to understand how this actually works. This is all I have to say about the risk of private equity. Thank you for listening.